where no matter what was going on in life as a kid, no matter good, bad, and different, there was always like wrestling on on Mondays, Thursdays, Saturdays, like it was Sundays. It was easy mm-hmm. to know I have something to look forward to. And I kind of still treat it that way. No matter what's going on with work or family life or whatever, there's always that constant of, I know I have something to look forward to, to sit down and relax, even though I'm much more critical now because, you know, I'm a cynic. What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Tom Talk Fresh, and stand back for another interview. This time, I'm joined by the one and only Mike Straw from Insider Gaming. So, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. I'm uh, I'm excited to talk wrestling and whatever else you got going. Mm. So, if we take this back, Mike, where do you first discover wrestling as an overall fan? I think I was about like seven or eight years. Yeah, about seven or eight years old. My grandfather used to really watch it. So my mother never liked it, didn't want it out at the house. But if I was with my grandparents, she couldn't tell her. Back in the day. (laughs) (laughs) Look. I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to stop that and start that again because my internet connection cut out. No worries. So, as I said, uh, well, welcome on the show, Mike. As I said to you, where did you first discover wrestling as an overall fan? Yeah, it had to have started uh, back when I was about seven, eight years old uh, with my with my grandfather because my mother didn't really like wrestling, still doesn't like wrestling, but didn't want it on in the house when I was a kid. Uh, but if we were visiting my, my grandparents uh, out of state, couldn't really tell my grandfather no because he's watching it if I go out and sit with him and watch it. And it was like peak, just the beginning and like peak attitude era. So I saw the normal cast characters like Stone Cold and The Rock and things like that, Undertaker. And then uh, quickly realized when he flipped over to WCW that I liked WCW a lot more as a kid. So it, it basically started when I was a young kid and it just kind of blossomed from there to where everything's just expanded in my love for it. Mm. You talked about their um, loving WCW more than WWF at the time. So why was that? I think it was always I liked the Lucha Libre wrestling. Um, I'm not a big guy. And when I was a kid, I was like, I want to do that. So like, even now I'm 5'10", 5'11". Uh, I, I want to do that. And those were the size of people I expected to be, uh, not these larger than life individuals, more of the, these are the people that look like me, look like me in air quotes, uh, that, that I could do it. And it just was fun to, to watch them do these, these spots and these moves and watching guys like Juventud Guerrera and psychosis and Chris Jericho and Dean Malenko and all this stuff as a kid that I just fell in love with. Mm. Normally at this point, I ask my guests, what if you discovered the wrestling that we have today as a kid, uh, do you think you'd be into it? And then if we flip the question, uh, if you discovered um, the wrestling you discovered as a kid with your adult sensibilities, but no prior wrestling knowledge, do you think you'd be into it? So today's wrestling, a hundred percent. If I loved Lucha Libre back then, then there's no doubt I'd love it today. Like there's certain things, like sometimes spots take too long to set up, in my opinion, uh, that I don't really care for. But knowing how talented the guys are today and women, like a hundred percent. Back then, with my adult eyes, probably would I have liked WWF at the time? I don't know. Um, granted, I am not one against raunchy over the top obnoxiousness, but I've gone back and rewatched old attitude era and they never gave anything a time to breathe. Uh, so I don't know. Like, I like the idea of matches having time to breathe at times. And I think I, I I don't know if I would have fallen in love as easily as I did. I think back then I probably would have had to, uh, be convinced a bit more. Mm. You also talked about there your mother not liking wrestling and it being sort of you and your grandfather's tradition. 
So when you did sort of get into it, was there ever a moment that you was maybe channel surfing at home and you found wrestling and you was like, oh, got to hide this from mom. Like, don't know what to do sort of thing. All the time. It was like from the time I was like, I think like after I had fallen in love with it and watched it, we came home from a vacation visiting my grandparents. And if it, if it, if it was on, I knew the channels it was on. And I'd make sure my mother either wasn't home or wasn't around enough to hear it when we were on the family TV. When I was like 12, 13, I finally got my own TV. And I was just like, all right, just shut the door, keep the volume down. I'm not going to get yelled at. Uh, <laughs> eventually, it, eventually it got to the point where she was like, he's going to watch it. So why am I even going to bother fighting with it? Uh, so so the, it, it calmed down, but it was one of those things. She's like, I just don't like it. And I was like, I love it. I'm going to try and do all this stuff on my brother now, too, who is who's a couple of years younger than me. So maybe that's when I like it because she knew what we'd emulate it. Mm. Do you remember the move or maybe the wrestlers that you emulated the most? Triple H, 100 percent. Even to this day, Triple H, like, I don't know, something about him when I was younger, especially when I was like 10 in WCW or like 11, 12 WCW started to go under um triple h was who i gravitated to mm. so it was anything i would try and act like him mm. you talked about wcw going under there how did that first of all when you do start watching it and you have your own tv and stuff what is your fandom like where you're like are you sort of consuming everything you can find etc a hundred percent um because this was in the days of didn't have broadband internet yet so if it was on tv it was the only way i was going to watch it or if i borrowed tapes from from friends um but w like yeah if it was on i was going to watch it i knew raw was on monday nights i knew wcw was monday nights and then sunday night heat would start i'd watch that i i, I basically thunder i would watch so if i knew it was on as a kid i i went out of my way it's not like i had this busy life as a kid um so i was always yeah i would find it out i would i would go to watch it just because it was entertaining it was always that like constant where no matter what was going on in life as a kid no matter good bad and different there was always like wrestling on on mondays thursdays saturdays like it was sundays it was easy mm -hmm. to know i have something to look forward to and i kind of still treat it that way no matter what's going on with work or family life or whatever there's always that constant of i know i have something to look forward to to sit down and relax even though i'm much more critical now because you know i'm a cynic i uh there's always that thing for me to sit down relax and and enjoy mm. you talked about the the still having that almost what i would call childlike structure and excitement for wrestling even now when you know it's on you'll sit down and watch it sort of thing so what is the show currently in july of 2023 as this will be sat on for a while uh that you're like i sit and watch this no matter what my week's doing or i catch up on it later it's always dynamite um ever since AEW started it's been my wife and i so my wife is a big wrestling fan as well which makes our marriage a lot easier because mm. it's always something we know like when we were dating uh it was one of the first things i brought up as me liking and she was like oh i used to watch wrestling and then she got back into it because of me and it was like our tradition like when we were we started dating when we were in high school so we knew mondays we could stay together later because we were watching raw from 9 to 11 and then it was things like that so it was always like we'd schedule date nights around wrestling so it was raw for a while um we kind of got tired of the product being produced so it turned less and less into that where we were watching more out of habit AEW launched and it's like no now we're gonna make sure we make time wednesdays no matter what's going on we're gonna sit together we're gonna watch mon uh, uh AEW dynamite and sometimes my 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 oldest who's five will stay up and watch wrestling with us but usually he's in bed by then uh but yeah it's it's right now it's AEW dynamite every wednesday and then we'll we'll catch collision and obviously any pay-per-view we uh we we sit together and watch so it's kind of like appointment viewing for us no matter what happens we'll even if we dvr it every night we'll sit down before we go to bed that night and we will watch it together mm. 
So you talked about there your wife being a big wrestling fan and stuff. Have you done like any trips involving wrestling, like gone to a pay per view with each other and things like that? Yeah, we we go to every local show here where we're at uh, in Buffalo. But yeah, we our first big trip we went for wrestling. We went to WrestleMania 32 in Dallas. Um, because it was a bucket list trip. We had to go to a mania before we decided to have kids. Uh, and then we actually went to Forbidden Door because Toronto was only a couple hours from us. We went to Forbidden Door a couple weeks ago, and I'm still living off that high uh, of what being show, man. at that show. I Yeah, I, I still can't. Like last night, uh, I mean, from when we're recording this, I, I just was sitting there thinking, I can't believe... I was able to be in person to watch Omega Osprey again and then watch Okada and Danielson, two guys who I never thought would ever face off against each other. It was just an incredible, like just wrestling fandom experience from in my book where I'm just like, nothing's going to top this. And then, yeah, we, we look into see what we're going to travel. We're going to try and go to mania next year. Who knows? Uh, It's just one of those um, things where if, if it makes sense, we, we like to go. Mm, I know what you're saying completely there. So you also talked about there being at Forbidden Door. You're the first person I've had on since Forbidden Door. So I'm curious to know your reaction to Brian Danielson's final countdown entrance. Um, if you would have been next to me, I screamed like a little like like a little child. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I heard the the pulsing that happens before the theme, and I'm like, no. Like, like audibly, I'm sitting there going, no, they didn't do it. No, no. And then the trumpet sound and I'm just blown away like a stag. My wife's like, what is this big deal? I'm like, you don't get it because she she was always a mainstream like WWE fan, like growing up, like she's team extreme Lita. She's in love with Lita, her favorite of all time. Uh, But for me, it was like I grew up once I hit like my high school age, like ring of honor came around and it was just like, this is my light. This is incredible. Like ring of honor is just all these great wrestlers. So hearing that again, just kind of, I don't know. It brought me back to being a a high school kid and just sitting, watching ring of honor shows again. So Mm -hmm. it it just like brought all this wave of emotion back, which I know I'm not the only one who did it. Oh, I was sitting at home and even I had that moment of like, they did because I'd stayed off social media sort of thing. And I was like, they didn't, did they? And you like your good self, I definitely had that moment of like, okay, I'm a happy man for the rest of the day now because they did this. The match can be terrible, which it wasn't, by the way. But the match can be terrible, but they did the entrance, so I'm a happy man. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. So you talked about the changing sort of the wrestling products you watch when as you got older, so maybe... You started off watching the mainstream stuff and then maybe you discovered Ring of Honor in high school and stuff and maybe the mainstream stuff took a step back. Would you say that's true? Uh, yeah, yeah, no. Like I took a little step back as to where I wasn't because life gets in the way, right? Uh, where I wasn't as dedicated as I was. But I would always find a way if like someone said, oh, this is something you need to go out of your way and watch. Mm. I would go out of my way and watch it and and sort it out. And now the older I get, I mean, maybe for the past, basically since I graduated college uh, 10 years ago, um, I make sure if there's shows that interest me, I'm going to watch. Uh, I, I'm a lot more into wrestling again now. It's I'm, I'm basically my fandom is back to what it was back when I was in high school because my responsibilities, they're more, they're greater. Right. But now I can dictate my free time a lot more. So my free time when it's just me or it's usually catching up on wrestling while I'm playing a game or playing my guitars or whatever I'm doing after the kids are in bed, I'll throw a show on my TV here and I'll I'll enjoy whatever's on. And it's kind of just, it's been nice to get back to that point because there's so much to consume. It can be overwhelming, but mm. there's so much to where now I can really choose what I want to enjoy. Like mm. just because it's there, I don't have to watch SmackDown on a Friday. I don't have to watch Impact on a Thursday. But if I'm sitting there going, I really want to see what's going on, I will put on like an Impact or a Ring of Honor or whatever it may be now. How much has the internet helped your fandom? Because you talked about that picking and choosing maybe you won't watch a full show but will you if someone says 
you've got to check this segment out, for example. Will you do stuff like that? It's helped and it's hurt, right? It's been kind okay, of that's a, interesting. A, a mixed bag. Like it has made me f- aware of people that I should be aware of. Like without the internet, I don't think I would have discovered Willow Nightingale as early as I did, who I adore. I don't think I would have discovered GCW. Uh, I don't think I would have found like certain wrestlers, other wrestlers, but it was, it's also made me a lot more jaded and a lot more for lack of a better term an ass when it comes to <laughs> my wrestling fandom that's like, interesting though Would it, you mind elaborating just, on that yeah i i've just become very much more argumentative because i've realized a lot of people i take bait if pe- <laughs> let's put it <laughs> that way people will make a post and I'm like so you're 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 dumb and here's why you're dumb and here's why you're wrong or whatever it may be and I think without wrestling, I might enjoy it more. I might be able to, I think my cynicism might be uh, less if I was able, no, no internet, no social media. And I was just sitting there watching wrestling. Plus it also stops me from being surprised anymore oh, because yeah, everything, sure. everything is out there before. That's why like when the final countdown hit, I was genuinely surprised when Drew McIntyre came back at money in the bank i was genuinely surprised when cena showed up genuinely surprised and i miss having those feelings and i could just mute things on on social media and avoid it but i'm like a lot of people addicted to that for some reason so you end up getting spoiled by a lot of things so yeah you don't really get that big major uh enjoyment or shock factor in a good way surprise factor so yeah wrestling it's kind of it's just this mixed bag where no there's no way i would have found out as much but there's also i don't get surprised anymore and and that's one feeling of wrestling that i really miss is that true genuine surprise when something happens or someone shows up at a company or someone returns or whatever it may be Mm, i know what you're saying completely there so you talked about their playing games in the evening and stuff and things like that what comes first? Is it working? Because you told me off camera, you used to work for Fightful. What comes first? Is it working in the gaming industry or is it working for Fightful? Gaming is just a different beast and I absolutely love it. Uh, I don't think I'll I'll ever not be in this industry. Um, it's just, it allowed me to take something I've been passionate about since I was like three years old when I first picked up a Sega Genesis controller. Ooh, um, console. Hmm? Yeah, and uh, it's just, it's fun. Like, Fightful, the stuff I do, and I still go back every now and then for things. Uh, last year, I had a, a piece for them for Fightful Select. I've done stuff when they did their Fightful magazine, and I will always love and respect what, what Sean does over there and Jimmy and, and Joel, Jeremy, everybody, Kate, uh, Alex, like literally Robert, everybody who works there are great people and some of the I best people agree. I've ever met. Yeah, they're some of the best people I've ever met. And even though I've only met a couple of them in person, but ever talked to, ever had phone calls with, whatever it may be. Um, I mean, they gave me my first opportunity to cover the UFC as a as a media member, so that was incredible, an incredible experience to do that. Um. So yeah, but the the gaming industry it's just a different beast. Everybody is so passionate. It's kind of, in a way it's like wrestling because when you get that person that is really passionate about what they do and what they've accomplished or what they're working on in the industry, you get some of the best conversations ever. And gaming coverage is no different. Like mm-hmm. if I get somebody I'm talking to a developer who's working on this game, you sense that passion and love in what they're doing from the moment you start talking to them. So it, it's just all those it's hard to explain the the feeling you get uh when when you get those like really good stories really good interviews really those meet those really great people mm. so what what comes first though is it it might sound like a very dumb question did you, you talked about they're working for fightful what how do you end up then working in the gaming industry so I had been covering the gaming industry since I, I used to be a little bit of a backstory on our side. I was an NHL reporter Please. for, yeah, I was an NHL reporter for about four or five years. I started in 2009 and then I covered the NHL regularly into about 2015. But in 2013, I had an opportunity to, to cover gaming 
as a as a side gig in or 2012 i should say and i took that and i realized i really loved it and then i was given an opportunity to kind of grow uh a, a, a launch a gaming site with with a company called fansided i was able to grow there and and continue and then i just kept branching and realizing no this is this is really fun so I started to step back from covering the NHL and watch more of that as a fan. But, and then I got into wrestling writing kind of by a odd chance because Sean used to work at fan sided for a short period of time. And we came across each other there. So when he and Jimmy, when he signed on to, to lead fightful with Jimmy, he reached out to me to come on and be an early contributor. So it kind of just, and I was like, you know what? This sounds like it could be fun. So I worked I worked as a regular contributor there for about a year um, before the gaming stuff kind of took on a whole new level. And I was focused more on that. Mm. So if I said to you currently, because it's obvious you're both passionate about gaming and f- wrestling. If I said to you, look, you have to pick one. Which one are you picking? I would probably have to go gaming. It, it's just been it, it's been too good to me for me to to turn my back on it right now. <laughs> I understand. So you talked about the some of the similarities within gaming and wrestling media. What are some of the differences, mate? Uh gaming. It's. I, I'm going to say it. I might get people arguing with me. Uh, it's a lot more time consuming to cover. Mm. Um, solely because you're you're spending, especially if you're writing reviews and things like that, or impression pieces, you're spending upwards of twenty, thirty hours on a game to write a thousand words or whatever it is. Um, plus with, with wrestling, you at least get that time to enjoy a lot of the stuff that you're watching and that you're talking about. Like you get to really soak it in with gaming. You don't, which is the one big downfall uh, of being in this industry is you get a game, you write about a game, you're on to the next. You don't get to really like go. Ba- There's not time. Like with wrestling, you can go back and watch a 20 minute classic match. With gaming, it's tough to go back and play a game again once it's out the door and you've moved on to covering other things because there's so much content, so much coming out that it's like, I have to talk to these people now. I have to run these stories. I have to do this and that. It's just, it's a never ending cycle. Like, the, it, it's been hard for me to enjoy games. Like, it, it gets tough at times. So I made a goal of mine this year to enjoy Diablo four because I didn't want to cover it. And I just wanted to finally have a game that I can sink my teeth into. And and to be honest, it's, it's really reignited my passion again uh, in a big way solely because I was able to enjoy, I'm able to enjoy that game without the eyes of media uh, being a member of the media on it and critical. I'm enjoying it as a fan again. Mm. So you get these things where it's tough, like wrestling and I'm not in the wrestling media every day. So I don't know. The people who review every show, if they can enjoy it. But in my mind, it's a lot harder to enjoy the games you're playing when you can't than going back and watching like a, a great wrestling match or whatever it may be. I know what you mean, though, totally. So you talked about there some of the things you do to sort of avoid burnout in the gaming industry. Do you have anything that you have put in place? Because as you said, your wife is a big wrestling fan that you put in place to make sure that you don't get burned out with rest. Yeah, it's a lot easier because I don't, it's not my job. Uh, Mm. So I can just say, you know what? I'm taking a few days. I'm not watching anything or I'm taking a week. I'm just not going to watch this week. I'm kind of, but I think with wrestling, it's always different. There's always something different going on with gaming. There's a lot of the same because companies go with what works, right? Uh, they, They follow this standard thing over and over and over. But with with wrestling, everything is different. If I want two big meaty men slapping meat, I can get it and then completely get this like juxtaposition of two five foot three lucha stars flippies, flippies, yeah, running around doing flippy shit, right? So mm-hmm. I, it's that big difference that keeps things feeling fresh. Whereas gaming, a lot of it, that's why I love indie games uh, because everybody tries something different that keeps things fresh but when you're getting into these big titles everything starts to feel similar but even with the big wrestling companies there's still enough difference in between the the wrestlers and the characters and stuff that it keeps it feeling fresh 
which this is going to be a very left field question which gaming media person you've worked with would you think would be they'd be good if they covered wrestling and then vice versa which game which wrestling media person for example maybe from fightful that you've worked with would be like if they ever wanted to cover games they'd do it very well I'll do the second half of that question first because it's a lot easier to answer. I think Jeremy Lambert would kill it. Um, I mean, he does amazing work with what he does now, but I think he would absolutely be a, an incredible stud uh, if he wanted to to jump ship and, and come on the gaming side. The gaming covering wrestling, you know, uh, there's Rebecca Valentine from IGN who has done great things from her start. She, she used to actually work at fan sided as well for one of their sister sites or children sites, uh, moved to GI biz and, and is out at IGN doing incredible work. And, and she, she'll live tweet wrestling wrestling. And it's the greatest thing watching her, <laughs> reading her, her, her live tweets of the shows of dynamite and whatnot. Um, but if she ever decided to go from gaming coverage to, I'm going to start covering wrestling, she'd be just as, incredible there winning awards for that as she has done uh doing gaming because uh i think i'm good at what i do um i don't compare in the gaming industry to the work that she puts in it it Mm. just i i don't she's that damn good at what she does Mm. you talked about there and you sort of said i think i'm good at what i do what do you do on them moment on them days like to reassure yourself because we all have a little bit of self-doubt at times Correct. Yeah. What do you do? What do you do on those days that you're like, okay, this piece hasn't done as well. This may maybe I've put something in this that's going to be people aren't going to like. What do you? What have you put in place to maintain the old mental health? If you know what I mean, when it comes to online stuff. So I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I think I'm learning every day when it comes to that, and I think we all are in a way. Mm-hmm. I. I have those days, like you said, everybody has those the self-doubt and things like that. It, it's it's tough uh, for me personally. Like, I'll go, you know what? I've broken some big stories. I have covered some of the biggest news that's broken in this industry in, in my 10 plus years covering gaming. Um, But there's still times where, all right, there's people I know that do it better. And there's always going to be people who do things better than you than you no matter how inflated your ego is or whatnot i like i said i think i'm good at what i do but i know i could be here and it's always like why am i not here why am i here which is still good but why am i not in this upper echelon um so for me it's just i i constantly have to remind myself look at the stuff you've done and look at where you came from even as much as five years ago um i'm with a great place now at insider gaming uh it's I was at a great place for six years at sports gamers online, but that got to the point where like work kind of got in the way. My, my other, uh, my, my other work as a software developer kind of got in the way and I had to step away. And my goal was to like, to be honest, I was done last October. I stepped away and I was like, I'm done covering the industry. I just want to focus on my development. And, but then I got an offer from insider gaming that was really, really good to come in and kind of do what I love to do, which is tell stories more than just, I report the news that's going on, but I love telling stories, interviews, things like that. Mm. Um, and it was just too good of a deal offer to pass up. So I came back and to be honest, I'm so happy I did because I'm in, in such a great place. So this has kind of been that being where I'm at and what I'm doing now has kind of been that like validation like we're not a major outlet we're a newer outlet only about a year old but we have the talent and the people in place to become a major outlet and that's what i love about it we're building something like sure i'm not with the big like gi biz or vgc or ign or game informer or whatever but at the same time like i love what i'm doing uh if like Years ago, I would love to have worked for a place like that. And there's a part of me that still does. Uh, but I don't know if I'd ever want, as long as Insider Gaming's around, I don't think I ever want to leave it. We're ha- It's so good what we're doing. It's so much fun what we're doing. And, and we're really starting to grow. And the sky's the limit for what we can do. Hmm. So you, that's very cool. So you talked about there, the sky being the limit. What are some of your goals in gaming development? And then... You talked about occasionally you'll do pieces for Fightful and stuff like that. 
So what are some of your goals occasionally covering the wrestling media? Do you have any goals within the wrestling media itself? And what are your goals within the gaming media? So the wrestling media, my bit, one of my big goals was to write like a major feature story, like tell a story that people may not have known. Like, it's one thing when you sit down, you can interview somebody and tell a story based on that interview. But I wanted to do this major story. And I can. I, and luckily, uh, a couple of years ago, it was the May, June 2021 issue of Fightful magazine. It was, I believe, their second issue or third issue. I got to do a story and I have it framed up here and I had to double check when it was. Um, I got my first ever cover story on a magazine because I oh. covered um, Dale uh, Gagne's. Uh, um, AWA that he tried to start in the early 2000s and I got to talk to John Stewart who was a partner of his I got to talk to Justin Roberts um, uh, for the story who was great to talk to it was one of those it, it was a bucket list thing that I got to write a five six thousand word article story on something but people haven't learned and you can go if you are interested in reading that it is on fightful select now uh you can read it you just have to search uh the greatest story never told on there and you'll be able to uh give that a read it's a long read but it is by far my favorite piece in all of media i've ever written that's really uh, cool uh the gaming side of things i do have some bucket list things mainly from a content production. So I don't know if you remember um, the old G4 TV. There was G4 that relaunched and died already within a, a year or so. Um, but back in the late, early 2000s and mid-2000s, G4 had this show called G4 Icons. Mm. And it was a documentary. It was a half-hour documentary about various game franchises, various major people in the industry, like Will Wright, who was the creator of The Sims, Ed Boon, the creator of Mortal Kombat, Madden, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, all these things, Mega Man, Arcade, the video game crash in 1983. And my goal in in game media was is to always is to bring that back in a way. Bring everybody does these like deep dives, like um single production person productions on their YouTube and, and on their channels, which are great things. My goal has always been to bring back a series like the old G4 icons where you have all these sit down interviews with various gaming journalists, various people who were there at the time who've worked on said game or worked for said company or whatever. And have this documentary of the past, present, and future of whatever the topic is. Uh, that is always a goal of mine, and to me, it's I'm not going to be happy mm. with my career if I can bring that back. Without sounding maybe disrespectful, or maybe I've got the wrong end of the stick, quote-unquote, is it a bit like Dark Side of the Ring for gaming? Those, <laughs> Yeah, kind of. Not as deep, not as like dark pun not intended. Yeah, dark. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but I'm like, I kind of, there's no other way to describe I'm it. I'm the host. I'm the host. Okay. <laughs> uh, there is, yeah, it, it's kind of just not as yeah dark and it's just, but you get those insights of people who are there, people who are around. Yeah. Mm, that's very cool. So as we look at wrapping this up, Mike, we are going to do a segment that I call, because I do want to be respectful of your time. We're going to do a segment that I call generic questions. Those of you that have seen my interviews before, where I swear ask my guests the generic wrestling questions they might get asked on social media, such as Mike's favorite match, favorite overall pay per view, such as for example Double or Nothing 2019, favorite uh, wrestler's theme song, favorite tag team, and favorite wrestler. So now Mike will have a place to be like, I've answered this. Please go yeah, watch this. <laughs> so what's your favorite match of all time? Um, I, it, this is probably recency bias, but Omega Osprey 2 from Forbidden Door takes that cake. It was Zayn versus Nakamura from TakeOver Dallas. It was the Ooh. best match I ever saw, best match I was ever in person for. Um, but Osprey Omega 2 took that over. Hmm. What about your favorite overall pay per view? Oh, that's tough. Uh, Favorite overall that I was ever in person for was Fully Loaded 99 because Ooh. it was my first one. Uh, favorite 
overall pay-per-view ever. Oh, that's tough. WrestleMania 17. Oh. Mm-hmm. Why does that one speak to you? Every match was fun. There was not a dud match on that card. Anything, even the six-man tag with the APA and Taz versus the uh the right to send everything it was just so good in that on that show. Even, even the, China versus Ivory was good. Even the gimmick battle royal was fun. Yes, it was the greatest thing. Even if Iron Sheik couldn't do anything and he ended up winning it, everything was amazing on that mm. show. I agree. Uh what about your favorite wrestler's entrance music? Uh oh this is good. All time or currently? All time, if you don't mind. All time greatest entrance music. Oh man. Break the walls down by Jericho for Chris Jericho. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. What so is- it it's uh partially because when my wife and I got married, we had our wedding party enter the enter this the reception doing wrestling. Uh, doing wrestling entrances, which was so much fun. Oh, wow. And we came into a mix of uh, Break the Walls Down, transitioning to Dolph Ziggler's Here to Show the World. And so, but Chris Jericho has always been just incredible to to, to watch. And the, the theme, like the, the ever since he debuted in WWE, that theme is just iconic to me. Just quickly before we do the last two, what's your thoughts on obviously in AEW he uses Judas? What's your thoughts on that? I hate it. Really? Yeah, I'm not. I love the song. Like I like Fozzie. I've seen him in concert a few couple times. I just don't like it as an entrance song. But I also think I'm like, there's nothing that's going to top break the walls down. So what are you going to do? Mm. There's, <laughs> there's nothing else to choose. Fair point. What about your favorite tag team? uh edge and christian uh Mm -hmm. edge and christian for all time uh the past decade or so um it's close between ftr and i really loved alpha uh american alpha when jordan uh when gable and um jason jordan were still when jason jordan was still wrestling i loved american alpha so what we do mike when someone gives me multiple answers for a couple of questions is we fantasy book on this show so (laughs) if uh, Edge and Christian, FTR, and I know you said Alpha Academy then. Nope. Uh, American Alpha was to have a match. Where is it taking place? Uh, who goes over? And what type of match is it? The hope is that it goes to the, the, the Sky Dome in Toronto. That'd be the hope it go, it takes place so I can go there in front of all those people. But I'd have to say Edge and Christian. I, not, I'd put over the young people and put over Jordan and Gable because... They're just, they're so good. They're so good. Like, mm. they're a team that just deserved so much more. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd say I'd say American Alpha. I, I'd put over American Alpha. That's very cool. What about, and then finally, who is your favorite overall wrestler of all time? Triple H. And people give me shit for it all the time. It's like, why? Why? I'm like, everything about him I love. The way he cut promos. I don't care that they sounded uh, like this uh, That's a all the time. By the way. Uh, I loved it. And from the run from 2002 to 2005, Triple H from the, the world heavyweight title being given to him to losing it to Batista at Mania 21 was so much fun for me as a Triple H fan. I was so hoping you'd <laughs> say that. So why was that fun for you sort of thing? Because I knew he was never losing that title. <laughs> <laughs> and if he did lose the title, he was getting it right back within a few months. <laughs> so when he lost it to Michaels at Survivor Series 02, I'm like, all right, he'll get it back. And he got it back a month later. He loses it to wrestler who shall not be named at Mania 20. And he got it back, you know, what, five months later, six months later. So it was one of those things of like he'll always he was always in that main event scene. And as a favorite wrestler, that's all I wanted was I'm was my favorite guy to be in that main event scene. Hmm. I that's very cool. And that's actually given me a new perspective on the Triple H reign of terror. I'm not gonna lie. So as we no, it, it was not a reign of terror. It's a reign of terror if you didn't like him. It was a reign of awesomeness. 
if you loved him, which I did. There was never a terror, and it was, oh, I wonder who Triple H is going to beat today. <laughs> That's fair. That's very fair. So, as we wrap this up, Mike, the question I end all my interviews, I believe, as content creators with YouTube, social media, uh, podcasts, and social media in general, we're all sort of going to live forever in some sort of very weird way. You talked about it a little bit, but what is one piece of work you want to be remembered for and one that you're like, yuck, if the good people could forget about that, I would appreciate it. So, and it's weird as covering gaming, I'm going to focus on a wrestling piece. My story, the, the greatest story never told, uh, f- covering the old AWA superstars from the 2000s uh, is something I would wish everybody would go out of their way to read. You can read it on Fightful Select. You can order back copies of the magazine digitally, Fightful Magazine. It is one of the best stories. Learning so much about like people lining up for a mile almost to just to have a chance to take a picture with The Rock um, was one of the coolest things things like some of these stories and that you learn about how what goes behind the scenes of promotions and stories on the road it's the greatest right now it is my top piece of all time that i've ever done and i'm just so proud of it uh pieces that i (laughs) something that i kind of like eh, about um anything i wrote prior to 2015 Wow. Looking back on how I wrote back then, I it, it wasn't good. Like some people might go, no, this is good. But looking at it from me, like as a younger going from a ve- now somebody who considers himself a veteran of over a decade to to, to a young Mike, it wasn't good. Uh, there's never been a story where I regret writing, but there's stories, plenty of stories where I go, ah, I could have done that better. I could have done this better. Um, I think as far as a regret, there are a couple stories that I've gotten wrong in the past um, covering gaming, like. NHL cover stories a few years ago where I was certain uh, Sidney Crosby was going to be on the cover and then because I was told by a couple people and vetted it as much as I normally do but it turned out to be wrong so I haven't talked to those sources since then because once I'm burned once I'm done with you yeah um but so there's there's certain things like that but it's 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 tough for me to always go you know what I hate any work because every piece of work I've done has ultimately I try to use it a learning like, all right, what can I take from that story that I wrote and the research I did and take it and improve on this um, and, and use it for my next piece and use it for the next video I do and use it for the next feature I do or use it when I talk to somebody next. What can I do? Like, don't there was one problem I had in the past when I would interview people, I would always talk over them a lot. Preach. I had a bad. Yeah, I had a bad problem with that. But I learned over the years to shut up and let them finish. <laughs> and, and I feel Guilty. like I've gotten. Yeah, like I feel like I've gotten better at that. Uh, and, and so I always think anything that I kind of like am upset about or regret, you, you just learn as you uh, use as a learning experience and, and it improves because no one is perfect. No one will ever be perfect. And if you think you don't have more to learn, then you are completely wrong. I would fully agree with that, Mike. So as we wrap this up, where can the good people find you, your work, social media, etc.? Social media, anywhere you could search for Mike Straw Media, I am on it, whether it's Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, wherever. Even threads now. I'm not mm-hmm. using it until they have a desktop app, but right now that's where I'm at on there. Uh, and you can find all of my gaming coverage at insider-gaming.com. Uh, some great stuff, uh, some great uh, features coming up uh, from the time we do this and constantly weekly features, weekly exclusive news on the site. It's it's a fun time over there. It's well worth doing, guys. I feel like I said this a lot recently. One of probably the hardest working people in media that I've discovered, but one of the nicest as well. So if you guys like this video, make sure you like, share and subscribe to Tom Fresh on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at Tom Fresh, and I We'll see you in the next video. Goodbye now.